you uh, for some disruptive activity. Don't forget, middle school and high school kids are at home with nothing to do. Let's move to economic injury loans. So before the CARES Act, there were a thing called disaster loans. We used them for hurricanes forever. In there is a thing called economic injury. That is what you will be applying for, and I'm encouraging everybody to apply, every one of you to apply. Um, if you're worried, well, maybe I won't need the money, then give it back. Um, there's no prepayment penalty. There is no upper limit on how many people can borrow. And um, you should get in line now and make that application. It's called an economic injury loan. I'm gonna share the screen in a second uh, to tell you about it. 501c3s, all charitable nonprofits are eligible. And this is what it is designed for. It's designed to supplement your lost income. So if your nonprofit was doing revenue of $40,000 a month, and now your nonprofit's doing revenue of $10,000 a month, it's a $30,000 delta, you would go to the federal government and say, I think I need $30,000 a month for 10 months. So that's $300,000. And you would apply uh, for that kind of a loan. It's for that purpose. And uh, you may borrow up to $2 million. And for nonprofits, the interest rate is 2.75%. And the term is 30 years. So if you borrow $200,000, it's only like $800 a month. It's $800 a month for the rest of your life. Um, but the cost of borrowing is really low and there's no prepayment penalty. Some of you were first movers and you applied uh, like two weeks ago. If you applied two weeks ago, the form is radically different. Then they changed it. So the SBA put up this form. It was the old hurricane form. It was clunky as all hell. You guys tried to apply. The internet was down. It was super slow, right? It was absolute nightmare. Unclear what a nonprofit should do, how to attach your information. Totally a mess. They then took the site down and they brought back up a new one. That one, if you remember, had a little square in the middle where you uploaded your documents. That was like five days ago. That's gone now too. There's a third way. There's a brand new system. Some of you who applied before got an email yesterday or the day before, and it told you, thank you for applying back before, but we would like for you to do the system again so that you can request the cash advance. This economic injury loan comes with a cash advance. So you, when you put in the form, if you did it before, there was no cash advance. If you do it today, it's a $10,000 cash advance. Um, and we're told forgivable. That, we gotta read the fine print, but we are told that that is a forgivable cash advance. But they will send that to you in three days. They says, I'll send you $10,000 in three days. And then you'll proceed with the rest of the loan. Now, those of you who've done this form, is frustrating as all hell for a nonprofit. I'm gonna show you why. Let me share the screen. And this is when I said that you are not alone. If you thought, I must not be able to figure this thing out, it's not you. It's not you. So let's take a look at it. I hope everybody can see my screen. Um, all right, so when you go to the SBA's website, um, it is uh, really clear that there is this economic injury disaster loan system and it's very streamlined and they're right. At the very beginning, you will choose what you are. There you are. You are an applicant as a private nonprofit organization, non-governmental, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you'll do some attestations. I don't do illegal activity. I am not delinquent on child support. I don't do aquaculture. I do not produce pornography, I, um, et cetera, et cetera. I don't do gambling, et cetera. And you will continue. Then this part all will make sense for you as a nonprofit. Your business's legal name, your trade name, your EIN. You click again, I'm a nonprofit. So let me, I actually pre filled out one of these for you. So um, you'll type it in. My business is called Happy Place. That's my 501c3. I'm not a franchise. I have a million. Don't, there's this question of cost of goods sold. Makes no sense for most of you. I would put it at zero. Revenue from rental, if you're faith-based, there's some questions about where the money comes from. And then you say your address, and then you put an email, and the date your nonprofit was started, 
Under current ownership, I'm gonna let you make your own choice. You could use that as when you as the CEO came in. So under current management, you could also use your startup date. Um, it'll ask you your business activity. There is no nonprofit business activity, so pick your favorite. It'll ask you for a detailed business activity. None of the below is what will probably be the case for most of you. And you'll say how many employees you have. Still feels simple and easy. Here's gonna come your problem. When they move to the third form, though nonprofits can apply, though we just saw where to push the buttons, you now have a problem. Who is the owner of your nonprofit? Nobody. It's a board of directors owns your nonprofit. The state, the community owns your nonprofit. So yesterday, I put in a call to the Small Business Administration Senior Administrator for the state of North Carolina, and I asked him, what do we put here? And he told me to call a phone number at the SBA. And at first, I thought he'd sent me on a wild goose chase, because um, I thought he should know the answer. Uh, and so anyway, I called that number today, asked, uh, and I ended up speaking with the head of legal at the US Small Business Administration, and I asked them what to put here. And they said they don't know yet. I said, well, that can't be the case. <laughs> okay. What do you mean? You know? He said, let me have, I'm going to put you in touch with somebody else. So if in the middle of this conversation, my phone rings, we might have real time information about what you're supposed to put here. Here is the advice that I was given before. Is it in first name? You would say, you would actually type, we have no owner. We are a nonprofit. We have no owner. We are a nonprofit. In last name, we have no owner. We are a nonprofit governed by a board of directors. Put in your phone number if you want. There's a title option. You could say that they're the owner. What percent do they own? This will matter. Say 100%. Your email. Now, social security number. This is complicated. I don't, it's not your social security number. You are not the owner. Um, I said to the SBA that I was going to type in 000. Dot zero zero dot zero zero zero. Birthday, place of birth. This is now a problem, right? What are we supposed to be doing for our nonprofits when we fill this out? For those of you who did it before, this isn't what it said. But those of you who did it before have been getting emails to tell you to log back in so that you can get your ten thousand dollar advance. You'll need to do this form again. So. Um, some of you will be bold and you're just going to make up some stuff here. What they tell us is an agent will call you later. In my mind, for real, you're going to call a million organizations, but they say yes. So you could do your best. I would do your residential, your street address for your organization, place of birth, if you want to use your community. Uh, but once you fill all of that out, I'm going to come back to this because some of you are saying I'm, I'm still not understanding what to do. Um, what you'll notice is there will never be a place where you tell them how much money you want. There is no place to ask for the money. So if you're wondering, well, then how will they decide? They are going to decide, they say, in a telephone call with you at a later date. Um, Neil, with the SBTDC, I didn't tell you I was about to call on you, so I'm going to talk for a second while you prepare. So the Small Business Technology Development Center coaches and counsels on this all the time. Um, they are also trying to learn this system. Uh, Neil, do you have any advice different than the advice or how I've described this to people? There is a bump here, but what I wanted all y'all to know, you, know, you might say, Aaron, that wasn't very helpful. What I want you to know is you didn't mess it up. There's nothing you did wrong. It is a problem that they're struggling with in this system. And some of the advice we get says, Fill this out so that you can move on. Once you move on from it, they'll, uh, there, you get to the next page uh, where there'll be some more information. Neil, are you there to, to say a word or two? Introduce yeah, ab absolutely. Well, first off, um, thanks, thanks uh, Aaron, for doing this. Um, for, for this, I, it just exactly what you're doing, I uh, echo it. Um, we need to get to the next page um, and uh, this is a fault of theirs, not of yours. So proceed with um, blanks that just get you to the next page of this application. So that's my my thoughts on it. So I'm 
helping yours. So you just got professional advice from the folks at the Small Business Technology Development Center and your local chamber of commerce to get to the next page. So if you want to, but my advice is do not. I, I don't think you need to put your social security number in there. This is not based on your, I at least have to put in a proper date. Sorry, I can't do two things at the same time. Well, I'm typing here, uh, Justin, you or Je um, Rebecca, there's questions that have been going on on the right. You call out a few of them for me while I type to show you all the next page. Damn it. Any questions so far? Other than this is maddening. So we had one question from Jennifer Player at Orange hey, County Jennifer. Habitat for Humanity. Um, and I answered her privately, but so that everybody knows, her question was to clarify for the econ economic injury loan. This loan is not forgiven. No. But the 10,000 part is. Hopefully. If you get to this part, I got stuck here. If you get here and it won't let you hit next, it's because there's a little thing way at the top you missed, which asked you whether your business was owned by another entity. And you're going to say no then you're given permission to move to the next phase. Here, they are wanting you to put in your name and your company. You want the $10,000 advance. So they're advancing the loan to you for 10,000 and then you're giving them your bank information. This is routing number, account number for your bank. For them, they say in three days to wire you $10,000, then, you read the fine print, please. Click the thing under penalty of law and submit it. There's a few other questions up here. Go ahead. That's great. Going back to the social security, we had one person ask, they said in the past, as executive director, they've put 0% ownership, but still included their personal phone number and personal social security number. We are told that? that this form, a Neil at SBTDC, the form doesn't like moving forward with no, what they want 100% of the ownership to be on the form. So like if a husband, wife, 50, 50, but they want all the names of all the people until the numbers add up to a hundred is what we were told. And so if you put a zero there, I think you might have a problem. They want it to be a hundred percent of the ownership, but you are just typing some, it feels ridiculous, right? You're just adding some things into that form that are reasonable and that will let the app, the loan officer know that you know, you know, under first name, it says we do not have a f owner. Second name, we do not have an owner. So back to the beginning, if you weren't on at the beginning, this is the economic injury loan up to $2 million, 30 year term, 2.75% interest. Um, the first 200,000 does not need to be collateralized. Neil, first 500,000, they're changing these rules a lot. But we're told by the SBA that the collateral interest is limited. Apply, get them to call you, get your $10,000 advance. Um, my advice is to get into this system. We have not completed ours because we are wondering about this nonprofit rule. If, I mean, where to, enter the things on that third section. I'm gonna guess the next five days, seven days, more information will be known. If you did already apply, there are news stories out today from the SBA. If you did it on the old form just a week ago, they will want you to do it again. I do not have that officially from them, but I have that in news stories. And I do know that if you want the $10,000 advance, then you must do it again. Let's stop here for a second, and then I'm going to talk about the, the Payroll Protection Act. Okay. Um, Aaron, real quick, yeah. um, to be clear, Kim Knox wanted just to, should they resubmit and put their name, social security number, and 0% as ownership? She just asked that, and I want to re-clarify. I would not do that. Your answer is no. My it answer is no. 100%. I believe, again, they're changing this every day. This, this form is now three days old, two and a half days old. In the one before it, you could not proceed unless 100% ownership was present. So that makes me think that you want 100% there. But I've not, I've not completed this. Um, and 
if if you can put zero percent there and it lets you go forward then maybe you proceed um neil do you have any advice on that anybody else done this that they want to give their advice on this we're crowdsourcing this absolutely i am I, i'm seeing some of these questions uh, kind of pop up too um and i i and I agree, I, I don't believe, just to kind of go back, I don't believe you should put your own social security number in there. Um, I don't think that you should, uh, particularly if, if this is some sort of automated process and it's connected with whatever your credit is going to be, uh, connected with the potential for you to get a loan, let's not get that involved. Let's not get you, so put in the dummy SS for a nonprofit. Um, <clears throat> that's just my, um, uh, just added two cents, I'll pass it on. The question is, can you put your EIN rather than the social security number? I don't think they're the right number of digits. Your EIN should be eight digits and your social security number should be more than that. So I think you put a dummy social security number in there. Now, if you did it the other way, fine. Somebody will call you, they know this is a problem. Hundreds of thousands of nonprofits are making this application, all screwed up, right? All screwed up. We just want you to get to the next application. Don't get stuck, don't not apply. You need this money, right? We want you to make the application. Um, worst case scenario, they ask you to do it again. Um, but what we are hearing from the SBA administration, and we had, I talked to them on the phone today, we are gonna have more information tomorrow which is their advice on the previous two forms were to dummy your way in it to get to the end. So you indicate that we, are, we don't have ownership, okay? There is a question about can you do this one and also the payroll protection. Yes, I believe we've been told by nobody that you can't do both. And this one was available and thousands and thousands of people were doing it before the CARES Act came into be. So I can't imagine they now would retroactively, I think you may apply for both. This one is to supplement your income as a nonprofit. The next one is to help you cover payroll. And Erin, finally, do you know how much is required for collateral based off this, so this particular one? So what we heard from the SBA professional who presented just 10 days ago on this was um, their collateral requirements are loose. They are gonna be pumping this money as fast as they can as they, uh, into the system. Someone said, well, can I put something for collateral that I already used as collateral on a different loan? And his answer was yes. Um, that he is, that when the loan officer calls or when you get more email about it, that conversation will take place then. But let's get you to that place of getting the telephone call. Um, what will they want for collateral? I am uncertain. Receivables can be collateral. Future revenue can be collateral. They're instructed to be super flexible uh, to try to get these economic injury funds out. Thank you, Bridget, both EIN and SSNR. Um, uh, maybe I'm just counting badly, our nine digits. Um, on um, the application, sorry, and I know you can want to move forward. The applications you submitted two weeks ago will be voided, correct? Well, I haven't received. been that I haven't been that direct with it. No. We've not been told that they will be voided. Here's what we do know. We do know that the peop some of the people who submitted them two weeks ago got notification it was accept got notifi got a confirmation number. And Barbara Jesse Black, you're on here. We believe they also got an email yesterday or the day before that said, thank you for doing that, but since you applied, the CARES Act has passed, you were entitled to a $10,000 advance. If you want the advance, click here and fill the form out again. So we know that that is true. Um, some people had, did not receive that though, which makes me anxious that their, their thing is somewhere in the middle um, and so, and there are reports today from the SBA that we want, that they want people to go through this new system. Um, I'm sorry, it's somewhat loose. It's somewhat loose. It's somewhat complicated. It's going to be bumpy. We're giving you the best information that we have right now. 
you will make a tough choice. You'll decide to wait until you're clearer or you will decide to proceed. That will probably depend on the urgency of your own organization's cash flow. That means you will need to resubmit. Perfect. So I don't think they were voided. Barbara, are you here? Did you, you submitted two weeks ago. Did you get the email about the $10,000? Is she here still? Has anybody submitted, completed it in the original clunky form? Remember that two weeks ago? Anybody do that? Dan, did you get an email that told you about the $10,000? He did not. I can share with you. So. I believe all of you, I have the email for most of you. If you did not get a direct email from me inviting you to this event, you heard about it from somebody else, type your email address into the group chat. We'll send back out information as we learn it. I will show you what that form should have looked like. If you did not get one in the last few days, that makes me a little nervous. Is anybody hearing anything sure. different? Go ahead. Oh, there was a question that Jess Ayler spoke to in the chat that just came up again, asking if we wait to apply, is there a risk that the fund will be depleted and no more funds will be available? So I have two, I have mixed met, so no promises. I originally, everybody said apply, apply, apply. There's $50 billion in this fund, it'll go fast. Then the CARES Act passed a week and a half later. Now there's billions and billions and billions more. Um, there were 50 billion sitting there for a hurricanes. They've added more to it. I've had no indication they'll run out. You tell me whether you think this is to be a choice you'll make. Do you think the Congress, if they learned that there were unfunded requests, do you think they would fund it or do you think they wouldn't? And based on your judgment, I would use that judgment to decide whether you can wait or not. Jess, do you have anything to add to that? Before I move to the PPP, Jess, can you talk a little bit about what you guys are doing in terms of flexibility you're giving to, to people you are investing in? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. Um, we have been hearing from a lot of you, and, um, and we also just wanted to share uh, what we've been doing at Triangle Community Foundation and, um, and our, our hearing. So, you know, one thing that we think is really important is that we are continuing to get grants out the door. So we have reinstituted weekly grants. Um, so we are um, scaling back teams um, going into our office to cut checks. Um, and our donor advised funds are recommending these grants. So, um, so they're being very generous. And um, in the last couple of weeks, we've gotten over a million dollars out into the community. Um, so hopefully um, many of you are support. Um, we also have competitive grants um, that many of you have gotten over the years, and we have lifted all the restrictions on any of those grants that were restricted to programs or projects. Um, we were already moving toward general operating support, so um, we um, just went across the board, lifted all those restrictions um, so that those funds can be used for any pressing need that you need. Um, we also have on our website, if you haven't visited trianglecf.org, We've been collecting any resources that are specific to nonprofit organizations, any collective um, uh, funds, um, any rapid response or relief funds that um, are um, across the four counties that we serve. So we encourage you to go there. Um, the rapid response funds that the United Ways in um, the United Way of the Triangle has been activated. So I would encourage you to go to their website um, and, um, and see. Um, if you fit um, the, the focus, um, I will mention that they have four areas of focus um, and um, I don't have it in front of me. I'll pull it up. Information. And then we'll Very streamlined it. application. Oh, it's food service to vulnerable populations, child care, education supports, rent assistance, and then essential health care. So those funds are being activated this week. Um, we also are um, talking with other funders in the area to see what type of um, assistance is needed on top of uh, rapid response funds. So we would encourage you to reach out to us um, and let us know what you are seeing and, um, and needing in the community. We have 
um, on our website, um, the email address of one of my colleagues, Ebony West, who is fielding a lot of that information. Um, we're trying to share as much as we can with our donors um, and um, would just encourage you all to reach out and connect. Thank you. The big takeaway for me on both of these is uh, Triangle Community Foundation grants are given flexibility. The three pieces that I would have advice for you all before we move to talking about the payroll protection plan is if you have a donor that gave you money that is restricted, please call them and ask them to lift the restriction. We are hearing um, that that answer is yes almost all of the time, but you have to ask. You need the flexibility right now in order to do base operations in order to make it through that. So whether it's Triangle Community Foundation, individual donor, I mean, worst they can say to you is no, right? But making that call is a nice touch. It also gives you a chance to talk to them, ask for the flexibility. Second, if you have a mortgage or any other bank debt right now that you are paying, please call your bank and ask for forbearance. Um, delay, whatever the term is, they are granting those with little hassle. Almost every bank I've spoken to is given at least 60 days uh, of no payment. Many are allowing six months interest only. So whatever debt you've got uh, that you were having to pay on, it's time to call the bank and ask for that uh, to be delayed. But with respect to your rent, uh, many of you are paying rent. Uh, hopefully your building is owned by an individual and that this is a little more flexible. Uh, many of our real estate investment trusts or big organizations that own uh, buildings, this is harder for them because they use your lease as collateral, so they can't actually say yes. Often they have to talk to their own bank about forgiving your rent, but we're seeing forgivenesses of at least two months and people should ask for more. So I hope that you are asking for those things um, right now. Let's move to the Payroll Protection Act. The PPP, it is only three days old, and not last night at 9 p.m., but the night before at 9 p.m., the rules came out. So these rules are just a day and a half old. Let me pull up that site for you. The Payroll Protection Act is part of the CARES Act. So in all of this, I need to, we all need to join together and be precise in our language. A Ford Fiesta and a Ford Bronco are very different things. So let's not use SBA loan loosely. It'll cause confusion with your bank, with your donors, with your board, with everybody. That first one we talked about was called the EIDL loan, E-I-D-L, Economic Injury and Disaster Loan. There are things called 7A loans, and this one is going to be the PPP. If you go to the Department of Treasury's homepage, there's a big red banner. Click it. It's going to tell you four very simple, easy to understand. The one that says a top line overview really is that. It's a one pager. If you want to talk to your board of directors about whether you should or shouldn't apply for this, this is a simple thing to send them. There is another one that is more information. I like this one very much. It's super clear. The purpose of this is to cover your payroll for two and a half months. 501c3s are eligible. Only 501c3s are eligible. I think and C19s, which I don't know what those are, but C6s are not eligible. C4s are not eligible. Only C3s. And what you are going to do when you borrow from this is that you are going to ask them to cover your payroll for two, for two and a half months. They're very specific about what counts as payroll. It will also cover a few other things. See this? It says payroll costs, mortgage interest, rent, utilities. They are promising you that they will forgive the payroll expense. They are saying that they will, it's forgivable, your rent and interest and other things. But here it says likely because of all the people that are going to ask for it, they anticipate that not more than 25% of the forgiven amount may be for non-payroll expenses. But it does say non-payroll expenses are forgivable. When can you apply? It says starting on Friday. I just had a phone call with several bankers. The banking industry had a telephone call yesterday. 2,000 banks were on the phone call. There's no way uh, that on Friday we're going to be able to do this. They just have no idea. The original legislation said up to 4% interest and up to 10 years to pay it back, but they wrote the rules 
two days ago at 0.5% interest in two years, and the banks are trying to figure out how they could lend at that rate. Um, they know what to do, they just don't know how to do it. But I'm gonna show you the application is available and you can fill it out. Your bank just won't be ready to help you process it on Friday, I don't think. So, all small businesses, all sole proprietors, all 501c3s can start doing it on Friday. There's more information about where to apply. Um, Rebecca, are you able to drop this link in for everybody so that you guys can snatch and steal that? It defines what payroll counts as. Salary, wages, commissions, tips, all of it. Your uh, payroll costs, your insurance. This, um, it says sick leave, medical benefits, state and local taxes under compensation. Everything is in there. The total cost of you running payroll um, and it says that they will forgive that if you use the money to pay payroll. Some of you may say, I already let everybody go. We already let our staff go. It says so long as you rehire them by June 30th, this will count. Some of you say, well, I might rehire them in June 30th, but we're still going to be closed. What will they do? They're going to get paid and do nothing? And the answer is yes. Yes, just like how unemployment works. They're either, you know, unemployment paying you and you're not doing anything. They may be paying you to pay your people even though you're not open. But this is to encourage you to bring your staff, to hold your staff on even if there's limited work to do. And this is to encourage you to bring your staff back. You may borrow up to $10 million. There's the interest rate. No payments on this for six months. It says the loan is due in two years, but again, you're hoping they will forgive it because you're gonna bring all these people back on and you will uh, pay them. Now, if you get the money, you bring your people back on and then you fire everybody, um, then no, right? You will have to prove that you kept them on board. So that was just three pages. It's a really simple form, uh, but it gets even simpler than that the application itself, and then they'll take some questions on it, is super easy. The way they're gonna do it is you put in one month's payroll here, they multiply it by two and a half, that's the amount you're requesting for the loan. That's it. Ch check some boxes, submit it. Now your bank doesn't know what to do with this quite yet, or where they're gonna get the money to give it to you, but I would fill it out, read the stuff below, be prepared for when your bank is ready. Get your payroll reports together, get your information together, be prepared to do this. Uh, so when the time comes, you will be ready. All right, let's do some questions on this okay. one. Yes. So the first question is about um, contract employees and grant funded employees. Mm. So a grant funded employees, I can't imagine why that would be any different. They are on your payroll. Um, and I think contract employees, well, it depends how you pay them. You can pay contract employees through your payroll process, right? Is this like, are you asking about a 1099, like the person you pay to manage your server? Or maybe there's someone who cleans your building who doesn't work for you as a contractor. But both your W-2 employees and here, I'll go back to the rules. The sheet really is wonderfully clear. Um, the sheet is wonderfully clear um, on what counts and who counts. You also, if you have, so we've been talking about nonprofits, but any organization may make this application. They can as a sole proprietor themselves. So if you have a contractor who's working for you, but they're their own contractor, they could apply for this and they are requesting payroll for themselves that makes sense. So we're told sole proprietors, independent contractors, nonprofits, for profits may all apply. You shouldn't double dip where you're applying for them and they're applying for them. Okay, what other, and folks can unmute. Rebecca is doing a, a wonderful, you know, the operator assist here, but you can unmute and ask your question or raise your hand. I'll need to get out of this system. Um, yeah, go ahead. I'm gonna watch out for raised hands. One question is about the 
what is possibly forgiven? I think it's a two part question. What does possibly forgiven mean? And I I'm really seeing that the possibly forgiven, the only thing I saw here was for non payroll costs, they are not committing to you to cover your non payroll costs for that eight week period. But there is a commitment. And if your employee makes more than $100,000, you cannot be reimbursed for anything more than 100. But it is. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Bridget had her hand raised. I didn't mean to cut you off. Hey, Bridget. Hey. So I was the one who was asking about the contract work first. We have three art therapists who work for us full time as contract art therapists. So we pay them based on the work they do. Um, but they don't have any other work that they really do outside of the work. We with the pay their social Institute. security. So I don't know if I can include them. They're not on our payroll. Our so we the don't pay their social government. security. No, they don't. Okay, so the federal government says, no, they don't work for you. They work for themselves. You pay them, okay. but they work for themselves. That's why. So I should tell them to apply for this on their own? Then. I think so. You can't both say they're not my employees and I'm not going to pay their social security tax and I'm not going to pay and then say they're your employees. So the feds say they work for themselves. They can, right? <laughs> that they control their own hours. They don't carry your business card. All those rules about what makes yeah. them a contractor. Uh, we'll get clarification on this. Your banker will help you. The first loan, that one you did through the SBA, through the SBA's website. This loan you will do through a bank. You may not do this loan through an SBA website. You'll do this through a bank and hopefully your friends at the bank will help you. But I believe that you have been telling the federal government as we all do for contractors that they're not your employee. So, um, but I don't know the answer to that. Uh, Neil, do you have an idea on this yet? Again, it's only four days old. We're still learning. Um, I'm gonna you Aaron I've had some calls today and I've done the same thing I said if somebody is getting a 1099 they're eligible to apply themselves for a PPP uh, because they're technically independent contractors sole proprietors however you want to define it um, but the but the beauty of this is yeah that might be more paperwork but what this the PPP loan program is saying is that you're both covered that's the good news Yes, but you should not apply. Yeah. You should not apply. Our advice right now is you do not apply for them as part of your payroll. They, if you read it right here, self-employed individuals, independent contractors, tribal businesses, sole proprietors, and they all do it themselves. So they are not your payroll. And one thing I'll, I'll add there. Okay. We had gotten something from some nonprofit organization that um, or a, non a group that helps nonprofits that in their literature, it said that um, we could include 1099 so employees, but it, according to what I'm reading here, it doesn't seem like we should. So I want to say to everybody on this call, if you have anybody, anybody's materials that you are reading or referencing that are more than two days old, you throw them away. Those people wrote those based on having read the law, but before the rules were written. So like the AICPA and a whole bunch of bankers associations, everybody was putting out guidance in the space between it being approved and between the rules being written. And they were guessing at what the rules would be. So some of those say it's a 10 year payback. Some of those say a four year in 4% interest. Some of them say, but they didn't know until the night before last at 9 PM what the rules were. So check the date on whatever advice you're following and do not follow old advice. Neil, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, my uh, the one thing I would add is I just I had a phone call today with a with a nonprofit. One of the things that we discussed was there may be circumstances where um, a contractor and you on the phone with one of them may derive a better benefit if they are receiving unemployment um, from the state and both the Fed based upon the act, the, the combined total. And that may be a better option for them than if they were to go and do a PPP loan themselves. So I think you have to take it kind of, you have to look at it and say, your suggestion is if you have, you want these contractors to be working with you again in the future. You want, when, when we get through this, 
we want those relationships to be there. So I advise you is to bring this information to them. Say, look, I value like an employee, but by law, you are an independent contractor. Therefore, here's the PPP program information for you to evaluate. And at the same time, state it's worth you exploring what outcome would be better for you if you were to consider both state and federal unemployment benefits. So perfect. Let me hit a few questions. Maura, yes, we're all talking about 1099 employees right now. Those are folks that are not your W-2 employees. They work for you. They feel like they're yours, but they're not yours. They're independent contractors. Dan Meyer, you are 100% right at the Arts Center. If you tell them that your payroll is, let's see, the Chamber's payroll is $25,000 a pay period or it's $50,000 a month, we then tell them two and a half months to give us 125,000, but we only bring back half the people. Then yes, you won't, you won't be able to write off all that they gave you. You will only write off all that you spent on your employees. So if you can't get your employees back because they love unemployment or because they found another job, then you'll have to pay back. Well, that's just fine, right? Because you didn't spend it. So be careful that what they give you, you are to spend on payroll and some of those other expenses that they said. But if you didn't spend it on payroll, you'll have to pay that portion back over two years. Yes, and Annie, the application is talking about ownership. Um, should we do the same thing on the SBA loan? That one I've not read as carefully. Let me take, let's all look at it together in just a second. Brace, your bank's going to have to help you. The Brace's question is, would you add rent and utilities into the monthly salary field too? Pretty bizarre, right? They only give you one field to put the money, but the instruction says you can count rent. So um, I don't have advice on that. I think you will have to make a choice with your banker on that one. It's um, So back to everybody's asking the same question. Let me describe it again. What they say is, let's go to the exact place in the form, that the law will allow you to, um, that what is forgivable, sorry, that what is forgivable is some things other than payroll. But then they warn you that they may not forgive all of it. My advice, I would do payroll only right now. I would use the other economic injury loan to try to cover the rest of the stuff. The safest place is to do your payroll. You take some risk on non-forgiveness by putting more than payroll in there. But this is all, this is not gonna get audited in some crazy way at the beginning. It probably gets audited at the end, but at the beginning, you getting your money is probably gonna be pretty flexible. What other questions do we have here uh, today? I'm gonna stop this sharing just so I can see you all again. Um, what other questions do folks have, right? It's amazing what they are offering you. It is an incredible lifeline. It's not obvious on all of it on how to do it, but thankfully they allowed nonprofits to do it. You usually get cut out, right? So they tried to include you, they just wrote a terrible way for you to do it. So thanks for including us. Thanks for not providing adaptive equipment <laughs> for us to use it. Um, but we're just going to have to do our best, right? Uh, do our best. Is it clear on the, um, it's eight weeks of payroll. Well, it says two and a half times a monthly payroll. That one, your bank is getting inundated. Get your stuff together. I would use a bank that you have a relationship with. Almost all local banks, there's banks that are SBA preferred, but that's most of them. You can reach out to us at the chamber or your local chamber and ask for that list. We also have contacts at every one of those businesses uh, and can help you with that. Dan Gonzalez had one good question, Aaron, it's a little bit back saying, what does it mean to certify that you need money for payroll? Does that mean you qualify only if you have zero cash assets or if you have reserves that you don't want to dip into? I think it is as it describes. It, um, I don't, I'm not aware of a standard for which you must meet to certify it. It is asking you in your professional judgment, do you need money for payroll? And you are saying, yes, I do. 
Um, and that can be for policy that you don't want to get into your uh, line of credit yet, or that you don't um, that you don't want to use reserves. But I think if they ever come back to you and say, "Why did you certify that?" you'll say, "Why?" I think you have to have a reason, and the reason is because we're really concerned. Some of you are debating whether to let your employees go or to keep them and do the PPP. And you want to know when would you get the money to make that decision. And we don't have a good answer for you. I have to assume that it takes a week and something, right? Before your application even makes it through your bank. I've got to assume it takes three weeks for them to process. So where are you a month from now? And if a month from now, when you get the money, you want to try to bring them all back, can you hold on to them until then? Can you hold on to some of them until then? But I would make some assumptions that it is not coming fast, or it's not instant, and be prepared for that. And that's terrible. If the feds will do their federal supplement and add the $600 to a layoff person's weekly wage, and many of our folks will have at least a pretty strong safety net uh, in unemployment. But my ask to all of you is keep close in touch with them because you'll want them back. you want them back. What's on people's minds? Unmute yourself, ask your question. Some of you, those are faces that are of great contemplation. Lisa, I'm looking at you. <laughs> You guys are doing tough stuff out there, right? Some of you have gone to 50% pay for yourselves. Some of you have laid everybody off. I was just talking to Barbara, five staff are left out of 45. Um, these are times of crisis. Um, but it is, I just want to, and forgive me for speaking about it so dispassionately at the beginning. It is what it is. And so we're going to try to give you the best information we can to help you make it through it. What other questions? Put your hand up. This is uh, Jennifer Player. I have a question that's that's not on the federal funding, but is around the town of Carborough funding. I don't know mm -hmm. if anybody has applied for that yet. But as we're talking about applications and what's applicable to a nonprofit or not, there was one um, particular document they requested from us that was a credit report. Yes, yes, I know. And for lack of a credit report, they've asked for my personal credit report. <laughs> yes, I know. I was close to sending them because I want the funding so badly. And then I thought, I don't just, that, that feels really right. odd. I don't they, know if anybody else has had that experience. So they asked me for advice about that. And I'm sorry that that's where you are on it. Originally, they <laughs> wanted the business's credit report. If they're lending to a business, and so briefly, they, you all can get a credit report. There's a Dun & Bradstreet does nonprofit credit reports. But if you went looking, I bet you can't find it. I went looking for my own, the chambers. It doesn't exist or it's hard to get. And then it has stupid things. There's no credit score. It's like fair and poor and whatever else. So they need something, Jennifer, to know. So I wrote them back and I said, I thought two years of your P&L and your balance sheet should clearly say whether you are solvent. They don't want to lend you your last dollar, right? That you spend to close. So they're trying to find some way to know about your economic health. I'll follow back up. Today's the deadline, right? Or yesterday was. So yeah, it was yesterday, but now they've, if you submitted by the deadline, they've, I think through the end of the week or something like that, you can upload the documents. And so I think, I just don't know how my personal credit report gives them any information about the solvency or the financial stability of the organization that I represent. Probably if it's good, it doesn't. If it's terrible, it might speak to your management capacities. Well, maybe. Um, <laughs> so that's why they want to, that's probably why they want to know. I think they're going to be flexible. I'd reach out to Annette. They're really debating it. Uh, the town manager and me and Annette are trying to figure out how a nonprofit can testify to its worthiness. Okay. Um, 
So, well, if anybody else, I, may, I haven't been able to look at the chat, but if anybody else has gone through this and has had experience or come up with another document, I'm happy to hear what, what else you've submitted. I mean, obviously, we have audited financials and P&Ls and all of that. I would so. give them two years of audited financials, your P&L, a balance sheet, and a letter from your bank that says that you're a customer in good standing and say this is going to have to do. Okay. They say, no, not unless I get your personal credit. Then you've got a choice to make on whether it's worth uh, $15,000. Uh, Carbro has a revolving loan fund that just closed. Orange County's got one for a half a million dollars. If you're in Durham, Duke University just pledged five million dollars of grants to local businesses. Um, that's today or yesterday. Um, and they're going to try to raise more. I'm unsure whether nonprofits are going to count in that category. Um, if you can find Tank Stand, you're done in Bradstreet. Um, we just really struggled to find our own, but there may be a credit report for you on Dun and Bradstreet. All right, friends, this look, this one right here seems to be the prevailing one. Hey, Aaron, this is Cordelia from hey, Compass. Hey. How are you? Um, I guess my question with both the EI uh, DL and the PPP is what's the potential downside for applying to either of these? Uh, for the EIDL, I think none. I would do it right away. I would do it, well, do it as soon as you feel comfortable that you can fill out that weird part about who the owner is. <laughs> but if they gave you the money and you close, let's say you got a business before, you would give it back. Let's say they gave you the money, you closed, and you didn't have it to give back, then you would have been bankrupt and they would, you're not pledging your personal collateral for it. You're not pledging your isn't your yourself any of your you know there's i think it's a pretty comfortable thing to do to ask the economic injury loan the other one the payroll one there's really no downside there's no even personal pledge there's no collateral for that one at all um, that one is trying to keep you alive long enough for us to recover from this and um uh staying you know be confident, pay close attention, keep up with your documentation. But if it goes like it's supposed to, it should work out. I think there's no downside. Anybody else have downside? What are you worried about? So it's been our tradition. We said an hour, right? And this is an hour. And um, yet 61 of us are still here. So what else is on people's um minds so for the chamber we're going to start convening you all more regularly our nonprofit members we're going to reach out we know some of you are in an executive group with executive service corps awesome keep that up but we're going to have this vertical we'll send you another one maybe we should see each other weekly every 10 days um, but we'll send out an invite so we can lay eyes on each other it is really alienating to do this work right now and to have a set of peers that you can complain to and worry out loud about or cry with if you need to will be really important. So we are gonna um, bring you back here. If you're not part of our network but wanna be, um, we'd be happy to have you um, uh, be part of our organization. Pilar, I see you've unmuted yourself. How are you at El Centro Hispano? You wanna, maybe you didn't mean to. I just was saying hello. No, Pilar? Dan, how's the art center? You may not be able to talk either. I see your, my, we see your lips moving, but your microphone may not be working. You're unmuted, but I can't hear you. Kevin, Bike Works? Doing good, staying inside. <laughs> Except for yard work. Paige, Extraordinary Ventures. Uh, uh, do you unmute me? I did. How are you? Uh, uh, EV is good. We're good. We uh, have 100% of our staff still on board, so I think that's an achievement um, right now. And we're we're going to be applying for the the uh, Paytech Protection Loan tomorrow. So we're hanging in there. Good. I'm going to stop the recording. Uh, but